Thank you, Stanley, for reading Psalm 20 for us today. That is the main text for our sermon. But before we get there, I want to give a little bit of the background. The title for today's sermon is, is Heart Check. And we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel 16 as well today. And the image that we have on this title is from a photograph of a mosaic of a church in the UK. It's around their baptismal font. And it's the Holy Spirit, the, the dove that's descending. And in Latin, it has these words, come Holy Spirit. And when I think about where we're at as individuals, where we're at as a church community, and where we're at as a country, uh, I, I think these, these words, come Holy Spirit, are very fitting. Let's pray. Lord, I would ask this morning, as we spend time in your word together, through your Holy Spirit, he would teach us and challenge us and encourage us and strengthen us and embolden us as we move ahead in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Very typically here at Grace Chapel, we finish off with questions. Uh, but today, I want to start with the questions. These are the questions I want you to think about. How have you reacted to the recent discovery of the 215 unmarked graves at the Can Loops Indian Residential School? Or how has the senseless killing of four members of the Muslim Asal family in London, Ontario impacted you? How might the Holy Spirit be moving us as individuals and as a congregation to respond to these and other Canadian tragedies? There's a, certainly been a heaviness uh, in our country and in our community for, for some time now. There's all sorts of harsh realities and difficulties in this world. Racism and problems between people and between groups. There's a, a sense for many of us as, as a country that we're having a lot of troubles, a lot of struggles. And, and I think very much if we look at the, the Old Testament prophet of Samuel, he might have been feeling some of these very uh, same emotions when he was looking at the state of his country, of his people uh, at that time. Samuel was becoming an old man, and if you look in the, the book of 1 Samuel, starting in chapter 8, uh, the people start grumbling. They start asking for, for, for a king. And the last verse of, of the last couple of verses of 1 Samuel 15 say these words Then Samuel left for Ramah, and Saul went up to his home in Gilbeth of Saul. Until the day that Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him, and very interesting these words, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Samuel, this older prophet, was, was mourning the, the things that he was experiencing or seeing in his country. Like many of us today with the, the horrific news of that family being killed in London just last week, or the discovery of all these unmarked graves at a Indian residential school in Canloops. There's a lot of sadness, a, a lot of heaviness uh, for, for us as a people. And, and how are we to respond to such tragedies? What should we do as the, as the people uh, of God? Samuel, I think, gives us maybe a little bit of a model for how to respond to some of these troubles. One of the senses I get from this scripture in 1 Samuel 16 is how it's important for us to acknowledge our, our dis 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 discouragements and failures, to, to acknowledge that things aren't right, that things aren't going well, that there's serious problems in, in our community that need to be addressed and, and, and need to change. Samuel heard the people's grumblings. He realized the inadequacy of his own children to step up into the role of giving leadership to the country. And, and uh, they started petitioning God for, for a king. They wanted to be just like everyone else. So Samuel didn't want to do this at first, but the Lord said, let it happen. And it happened. And they got this Saul who was, you know, looked good on the outside, but had a lot of challenges internally and became a king who didn't lead well. In fact, he disobeyed uh, the Lord. We're told in 1 Samuel 15 that God gave him a special task. And again, it's hard to kind of put this together with modern thinking, but he was to go and wipe out these people, the Amalekites, and not keep any of their possessions. 
just to, to knock everything out, kill everything and leave everything behind. But when Samuel goes to where this battle has taken place, in another location actually, when he's interacting with, uh, with Saul, we're told in verse 14 of 1 Samuel 15, but Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? In a sense, you know, Samuel's saying, busted. You know, you, you didn't do what God told you to do. And Saul starts tripping over himself. And it's a really pathetic, actually, um, way of how, he, how he's responding. He's trying to give reasons why he didn't listen to what God told him to do. And in fact, he kept some of these things he said, so I wanted to sacrifice them uh, to God. In the NIV, uh, in verses uh, 22 and following, Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is, the better, is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And this wasn't the first time uh, to have a conversation with Saul and say, you're, you're not going right. The way you're leading this country, what you're doing to our people, isn't the way, the things that God wants. I like the way that Peterson translates it in the message. Then Samuel said, Do you think all God wants are sacrifices? Empty rituals just for show? He wants you to listen to him. Plain listening is the thing, not staging a lavish religious production. Not doing what God tells you is far worse than fooling around in the occult. Getting self-important around God is far worse than making deals with your dead ancestors. Because you said no to God's command, he says no to your kingship. And in bringing this news to, to Saul, it, it didn't give Samuel a, any joy. In fact, he mourns. He is sad. He's upset with all that's taking place. And I think many of us can relate and maybe have, have some of those same feelings when we think about some of these tragedies that are happening in our country uh, right now. It's important that we acknowledge our discouragements and failures and, and bring them before the Lord. It's important that we, that we stop and we, we start asking God, what would you have me to do in this situation? Uh, a heart check encourages us to listen for God's clear direction. We're told in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Sometimes our sorrow, our sadness about the brokenness that is in this world can overwhelm us and make it really difficult for us to, to move forward and do anything. But the Lord challenges uh, Samuel and says, how long do you continue to mourn for Saul? I have a task for you to do. And perhaps this is something that we need kind of a creativity in our own thinking about the situations that are happening in this world. What should we do in light of the brokenness that we are encountering? What should we do in light of the tragedies that are happening uh, all around us? So Samuel has this interaction with God and we have it in 1 Samuel 16. He's a little afraid because as he travels from where he lives down to Bethlehem, he has to go by the place where King Saul is residing. And he knows that Saul is becoming increasingly paranoid and upset about what's happening in his kingdom. And he says, how am I going to get by? And the Lord gives him a plan for doing it. But when Samuel enters into Bethlehem, the local people are, are concerned because when Samuel comes somewhere, it could mean trouble for them. And Samuel has this interaction with, with Jesse. And Jesse starts bringing out his sons, one after the other. Look at verse 7 of chapter 16. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
And this kind of ties into a verse that we have in Psalm 20, verse 4. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. It's a really kind of a fun story we have in 1 Samuel 16 where you know, Jesse starts bringing out his sons one after the other. When the first son comes out, Eliab and thought, oh, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But he wasn't, that wasn't the right one. Then he brings out the next son and the next son and the next son and the next son and the next son all the way down to the eighth son. And where was he? Well, he's off tending the sheep. But that was the king, the second king of Israel, King David, who we have this psalm that was read for us earlier. Listen for God's clear direction. When we think about all the tragedies that are taking place around us at this time, it's important that we stop and we pray and mourn and be upset, but then listen for what God would want us to do. This psalm is a wonderful psalm, but it's also a psalm that is built in the context of a battle that's taking place. Scholars who look at the psalm, Psalm 20, realize that it's a psalm that the people are praying or are praying before the king enters into a struggle or into a battle. Now, we have a gospel of peace and love that we share with people, but this warfare imagery is something that maybe we can grab hold of and think about, about life as being a battle at times. In the first five verses of Psalm 20, we see a group of intercessions taking place. The people perhaps are around the temple or where the sacrifices are, are happening at this point. They see the king going through uh, these motions and they start praying uh, these intercessions. Well, one after, uh, after another, may the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. And some people think that perhaps even at that moment, the king was making some sort of offering to God. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. You see very much the success of the leader of the country would impact their, their success as a people and help them to move forward. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your request. And then verse 6 it, uh, it, is a real strong word. It seems like the voices change. It goes from the people making intercessions to some leader of this assembly standing up and proclaiming these really important words. We have it in 20 verse 6. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. And when I think about a heart check, when I think about the heaviness that we are experiencing right now as, as a nation here in Canada, I, I think it needs to make us stop and, and think about, are we willing to live out our declaration? Uh, to live out this declaration that God is the one who, who is uh, the ultimate provider of everything that, that we need. David goes on in verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. It's not military strength. It's not financial stability. It's not a, a great health care system. It's not an education that, that will, you know, a great educational kind of universities and colleges and so on. But our ultimate provision is from the Lord. When we think about this heart check, this challenge that we're going through as a nation, we acknowledge our discouragements and failures. We, we listen for God's clear direction. But we need to live out our declaration. If there's any, ever been a time in the, in the history of Canada where uh, the Christian message of love and peace and joy and stability needs to be communicated, it, it is now. But, but how uh, are we to do that? And the only way I think we can do that is if we deepen our reliance on the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit needs to be the cry that each one of us says in our own hearts and in our own lives. 
We need God's quickening, God's strengthening, God's encouragement to know. We need God's direction for what to do next. I think about the Lord Jesus when he's talking with his disciples and he says, I have so much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will, he will tell you what is yet to come. Uh, Jesus says earlier on that he's, his going away is actually for our benefit so that the Holy Spirit would come and inhabit his people and be involved in the lives of, of each of us. And this is something that I think we need to be open to. We need to be open to this idea that the Holy Spirit wants to work in our situation right now. And when we think about these tragedies that we've been, you've been experiencing as a nation over this past while, I think about the way we've treated our First Nations folks here in Canada. It has been a, a, a tragedy. It has been something that is, is a, a very negative mark on, on us as a people. And, and how are we to respond to such losses? One Indian residential school with 215 uh, unmarked graves of children who died there. That's only one school and there's many more schools right across our country, including here in Nova Scotia. And our heart breaks for the, the difficulties that these people have faced since people like us have arrived here uh, on, on this land. Or we, we think about this tragedy that happened in London, Ontario, just last Sunday night. Uh, a family of five going out for a stroll and someone runs them over with a truck, killing four of them. And they're still looking at you know, what was motivating this person to do such a horrendous thing. But it was simply, again, a horrendous thing. And we are, as people of faith, against all sorts of wickedness and evil like this. I'm reminded of Romans 8.26 that maybe describes another way that the Holy Spirit works in our lives. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So when we see and experience or know of such brokenness in this world, it should turn our hearts to prayer for this world and our friends and our neighbors and the people that we come into contact with. And somehow the Holy Spirit takes those and puts them into an expression of pain that maybe we cannot fully uh, understand ourselves. A heart check. It's been a hard time the past couple of weeks. It's been a sad time uh, in our country. It's been a sad time for the past 15 months of this pandemic that we've been going through. But it brings us back to the questions that, that I started the sermon off with uh, this morning. How have you reacted to the recent discovery of the 215 unmarked graves at the Canloops Indian Residential School? Or how has the senseless killing of four members of the Muslim Afsal family in London, Ontario impacted you? And how might the Holy Spirit be moving us as individuals and as a congregation to respond to these and other Canadian tragedies? I appreciated the words of a, of a pastor uh, in, uh, in the Strathroy area, close to London, Ontario, when he was asked about uh, this event. He writes these words. When we heard of the horrific events that transpired on Sunday evening, we, like our entire community and nation, were heartbroken and devastated. We grieve with and have been praying for the Asal family and our local Muslim community. Actions of hatred and violence are evil and stand in complete contradiction to our faith in the love and grace of Jesus. There's a, there's a lot of areas that we need God's direction for. It's important that we open ourselves up to be his instruments of peace and love in this community where God has planted us. Lord, uh, give us strength. Lord, through your mercy, give us direction. 
Through your mighty hand, give us support where we need it. Help us to know how we can proceed to honor you in all that we do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.